Uh, we're going to be in the Gospel of John. So if you could open your Bible up to Gospel of John. In the New Testament, it goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's the fourth book. And we're going to begin today in uh, verse 19 through 34. Last week, we entered into the Gospel of John. We waded in. And we saw a number of things. We saw John, the beloved disciple, writing this book. He wrote this book somewhere, scholars think, between 85 or 90 A.D. He's an old man writing this book at the near in the end of his life, reflecting upon the truth that has changed his life forever. And he writes this book. And he has one clear, overarching mission in writing the Gospel of John, and that's to persuade you and to persuade me, originally to persuade his readers, that Jesus was God. And that if you were to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for what he did on the cross, that you would be saved from the penalty of your sins. He writes at the end of the book, John 20, I write these things so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and that in believing in him have life in his name, have eternal life. So that's the purpose. That's the, the mission of John as he writes. He's unashamed. He's unapologetic because he has seen with his own eyes the glory of Christ. And he wants everyone to know about it. He wants to proclaim Jesus. He wants us to know that our lives were meant to revolve around him. We looked at the first 18 verses last week. And the Gospel of John lays itself out like this. The first 18 verses are known as the prologue. It's, it's John's kind of summary of all that he's going to tease out for the rest of the book. And he's, he writes these grand themes, as we saw last week, about Jesus being the creator and Jesus being the light of life and Jesus being the sustainer and redeemer of souls and Jesus being the, the glory of God himself. It's almost like if we were to think in, in movie terms, he's giving us the movie trailer up front. He's packing it all in with all of the good stuff and then the rest of the book he's going to kind of proclaim and tease out all of the themes that are found in the first 18 verses. And so now in verse 19, we're actually in some ways starting the Gospel of John. We're starting the, the story. We're starting the narrative. And we start with a, a classic case of mistaken identity in verse 19. One of our traditions is to stand as we read the Bible. So if we could stand, we'll read the section and then begin. Verse 19 says, And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? We need to give an account to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Verse 24. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Then why are you baptizing, if you're neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Jesus answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. Verse 32, And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Let's pray together. God, thank you for this word. And we know, Lord, that your word 
was given, is revealed to us to communicate the truth about you. And so we come to your word to learn. We come to your word to understand. We come to your word to be changed. Lord, use this passage of your revealed word to change us. Lord, thank you that we can gather together like this as a church, as a group, and open up your Bible freely and to study who you are. What a privilege, Lord, we have in the reading of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can take your seats. Well, our first scene as we look into this passage really begins with the background. As we start in verse 19, we see that there is a conflict brewing between a guy named John and some priests that were sent from apparently uh, the authorities on high. And we don't know really what's going on as this, as this scene is set. It doesn't give us the background in our text. In fact, there's really no background at all about this John in our gospel. We have to go to the other gospels to understand really what's happening. And so we begin, before looking at even verse 19, we begin with the background. Who is this guy? Who is this guy named John? We've got the, the gospel of John, and now we're talking about a guy named John. It's not the same John. They're two different guys. This is John the Baptist. We read about his story. We read about his life and his beginnings in the other gospels. We find in Luke 1 the story of John. John was born to a mother named Elizabeth, and he was born to a father named Zechariah. Zechariah was a priest. And, Zachari- and the, the way that the, the, uh, the rotation of the, the priestly service worked was that the priests were divided into different rotations, and they served at the temple in different slots. And Zechariah was taking his turn serving at his slot, and he was randomly selected to go into the inner temple and to offer incense. Now, Zechariah, it says in the text, was a blameless man. He walked in the commands of the Lord. He, both him and Elizabeth were, were godly people. They were a religious family. He's a priest. He's serving the Lord. He's living for the Lord. He, he gets called to do this incredible honor, this incredible privilege. He goes inside the temple to offer incense, and he's visited by an angel of the Lord. And the angel comes to Zechariah and gives him a message that would change his life and change the life of his family forever. He says, good news. Your prayers have been answered. Elizabeth was barren. Elizabeth was unable to conceive. They'd been praying to have a child. They had no one who could take the the family name. And this angel comes and tells them, good news. Your prayers have been heard. You are going to have a son. A child is going to be born to you. It's going to be a boy. And this child is going to be unlike anyone that you know, anyone that you that you've seen. This child's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit from from the womb. This child's going to come in the spirit and power of Elijah. And this child is going to testify and proclaim the way of the Lord. He's going to make straight the path of the Lord. The angel tells Zechariah to call him John. John wasn't a family name, and if you read the story, you know he, he has some disbelief that this is possible. They're very old The angel says, I'm Gabriel. I speak for God. I stand in the presence of the Lord. What I say is what God says. It's going to happen, and you're going to be mute until the baby's born. And that's what happens. Zechariah can't speak until the day that the baby's born. They say, what are you going to name him? He writes out John. John is the baby that's born. Six months into the pregnancy, we find out that Elizabeth has a relative named Mary. They come together for some sort of tea or whatever they do, social event that ladies would do back then. I don't know what they do. But they get together. She's six-month pregnant. Mary is pregnant with Jesus. We have these two, in a sense, miracle babies. One miracle Jesus, born of God. Another miracle in that he's filled with the Holy Spirit from from the womb. The text says that even in the womb, they they knew each other. They had a relationship of some sort. They leapt in, in in their wombs as they gathered together. They... They had a special relationship even before they were born. And John the Baptist and Jesus would continue to have a special relationship throughout their entire lives. So John's a special boy. He's not your usual little kid being born. And if the circumstances of his birth weren't strange enough, listen to the description of his life after he's born. In Luke 1, we read this. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, And he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance in Israel. 
we find out from the other Gospels that John has been living in the woods. John has been camping out in the woods, eating bugs. He's eating locusts. He's eating honey. He's dressed in camel hair shirts and, and a leather belt. He's kind of, he's weird. He's eating locusts, okay? That's his food. That's what he eats. That's what he enjoys, apparently. My son, Trevor, loves the story of John the Baptist. He's been asking me about, about the story all week long because I've been telling him we're going to teach on it in church. And I, always, I asked him this week, I said, Trevor, why do you love John the Baptist? Of course, he said, he eats bugs. That's why I like to hear the story. So, of course, we always have to tell the story of John the Baptist as he's eating the bugs. It's caught in his teeth, and my son loves it. But I don't know if any of that happened or not. But he eats bugs, okay? He's weird. He's dressed in camel shirt, camel hair shirts. He's not your mainstream religious guy. He's, he's marching to a different drum. He's the original man versus wild. He's survivor man. He's, 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 I don't know what he is. He's weird. But he's also called by God. We'll find out later. He's called by God to do this. When the time is right, when the time is right, John emerges from the woods. John comes out with his camel hair shirt, his locust breath. He comes out from the woods and he preaches. So just picture the scene, okay? Picture the woods. I, I get to see out the great landscape out there. Picture the woods. Picture a man emerging, looking like he hasn't showered in 30 years. And he starts preaching a message of repentance. He starts preaching at the top of his lungs for people to deal seriously with their sin before God. He's preaching to them this message of, of the end times. He says, the other gospels record, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So imagine, camel hair shirt John preaching, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The image that's conjured up in my mind is like the mall preacher at ASU. If, you, if you've been to the co major college campuses, almost every college campus has a guy like Brother Jed, who was the mall preacher at ASU when I went to school. And, th and this guy stood up on this platform that they created with signs of destruction and hell and you're a sinner and you're lost and he preached on a megaphone to people all across the campus basically proclaiming how horrible they were. How do you imagine that Brother Jed was received? Not so well. Pretty terribly. He wasn't received well by the Christians or the non-Christians. Everyone who gathered in that crowd to hear him preach got angry there was a sense of resistance. There was a sense of, of being insulted and offended. And people were, and people yelled insults and offenses back to Brother Jed. And I would venture to guess that not many, if anyone, was changed for the good of the gospel through an encounter like that. That's not what we read when we read this about John. He's preaching repentance, yes, yes. He's preaching holiness, yes. He's preaching that sin is serious, yes. But he's, he's not preaching condemnation. He's preaching preparation for the coming of the Lord. He's preaching a message of, actually, of hope. Luke says in one of his little verses that, just as, as, just as an aside, that John continued to preach the good news. He was proclaiming a message of repentance, but it was a message of hope. And people didn't get angry. People came. People came in droves. It says that people came from all over the Judean and countryside and from Jerusalem. People came in mass to hear the camel hair shirt guy talk about how they need cleansing from their sins. It's an amazing scene. John's ministry lasted one year, one whole year. And the impact that he had was was tremendous and was captured for us here in Holy Scripture. See, when he said to people, turn from your sins because the Savior of the world is coming, people believed. People took action. People came. They wanted to be ready. They wanted to cleanse themselves through the ceremony of baptism to, to receive the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Messiah. His ministry was so impressive that it caught the attention of the religious leaders. And that's the background the scene transitions now to our, our text as he is preaching this message in verse 19. The questioning begins. 
Read with me in verse 19. It says this. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. The Jews in this context were the Pharisees. We learned that in verse 20, 25. The Pharisees were the guys in charge. They were part of the religious leadership of the Jews. The Pharisees were zealous for God's law. They were so zealous for God's law that they created other laws to keep them from encroaching upon God's law. And then they created other laws to keep them from encroaching upon the laws they created to keep them from breaking God's laws. And so they created this, this series of works in order to stay right with God. These are the leaders, and they hear about John. They hear about his ministry. They hear about this camel hair shirt guy, this guy with this dirty clothes and preaching this wild message of repentance, and they hear about people flocking to him, and naturally they're getting concerned. Because why? Because they're in charge. And this guy is not a part of them. He's not a part of the mainstream. He's not operating within their authority structure. And so they, they come to find out, who is this guy? Who is this guy screaming at the top of his lungs, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And so they sent their delegates down to interrogate John, wondering who he is. And John says, he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Now that's not actually an answer to who he is. But that's what he says. He says, I'm not the Christ. Now, why is this profound? It's true, right? He's not the Christ. But just for a moment, step into his shoes and consider what has happened. He's lived his whole life in the woods. He's been kind of isolated. He comes on the scene. He's preaching. He's got hordes of people following him. He's so popular that now the, the big wigs are coming down from Jerusalem to talk with him. And they ask him this question. And in the back of their minds, they're, they're, they're wondering, is he the Christ? Remember that the Jewish expectation at this time, even if they weren't all agreed, was that the Messiah was going to come. This Messiah was going to come and restore Israel and was going was to bring God's rule back to the nation. So they're wondering, is he this Christ? Just imagine for a moment the temptation John might have felt as they ask him this open-ended question, as he's got hordes of people behind him. Imagine the temptation for him to say, I am the Christ. I'm somebody now. Look at all that I've done. It's not his response. His response is humble. His response is one of pointing them to another, another one. He has his eyes on his mission. He doesn't have his eyes on himself. He doesn't have hopes of building his own kingdom He's, he's there for a purpose, and it's not to testify to his own greatness. It's to testify to the greatness of the one who is to come. And so he says, I am not the Christ. He could have just said, I'm John. That's who I am. I've been living in the woods. He wants to make it perfectly clear, I'm not the guy you think I am. I'm not the guy you might suppose me to be. They press him again in verse 21. They say, what then? Are you Elijah? Now, this is a fascinating question because if you know your Old Testament, the end of the Bible, the end of the Hebrew Bible, the last book written is Malachi. And the very last thing written in the very last book of Malachi says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet to turn, of the, turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. There's this promise right as the end of the revelation of God closes that one would come in the spirit and power of Elijah. So they've been waiting not only for the Messiah, but for 400 years for this Elijah. And remember what the angel said to Zechariah, his dad. He said, your son is that one. Your son is the one who's coming in the spirit and power of Elijah. And so, again, he could have answered, yes. Yes, I am. I am indeed Elijah. Jesus says he's Elijah. But that wasn't the dominant identity that John had for himself. No, he has another identity in mind of how he wants to communicate who he is and what his role is. Are you the prophet? They expected a prophet to come like Moses. He says no. 
He's giving them, no, I'm not the Christ. No, I'm not Elijah. No, I'm not Moses. And no, I'm not the prophet. So finally, I think out of exasperation, they're like, so who are you, man? Tell us who you are. Give us your name. Give us something we can go back to. Don't you, don't you feel that way when you've been sent on a task by somebody else? And you're, you're just trying to fulfill the task of the person who sent you, and you're, they're like pleading with them, just give me something. I need to go back and tell them, just give me your name. Give me who you are. And here's what he says. He says, I'll tell you who I am. You're the Jews. You're the religious elite. You know, you know the scriptures. How about Isaiah 40? He says, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. How appropriate. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Doesn't say he's Elijah. Doesn't say he's Moses. Doesn't say he's Christ. Doesn't say he's the prophet. He says, I'm a voice. I'm a voice. I'm not a bigwig. I'm not a superstar. I'm a message. I'm a voice. The important thing about me is, is the message that the voice carries. Make straight the path of the Lord. In the times of Isaiah, they didn't have freeways. They didn't have nicely paved roads. Whenever a king would travel, they would send an emissary ahead, and that servant would declare, make straight the way of the Lord so that the people could come and they could fill in the potholes and they could take away the rocks and the debris and they could make smooth the path for the glory of the coming king. That's what John says he's doing. He says, I'm a voice. I'm a message. I'm pointing to one who's greater than me. You know what he's doing? He's the example of what we looked at last week. He's the example of the man whose life does not revolve around himself, but whose life exists to revolve around the Son, Jesus Christ. He's the illustration for us from last week's message. In his mind, he's not important at all. And so the priest asks the natural question, if you're not important, if you're not Elijah, if you're not the Christ, if you're not the prophet, why are you baptizing? What are you doing? What are you doing out here? He says this, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. The most menial task of a servant was to take off the shoes of the master after, walk, after his, a long day's worth of walking in dirt and mud and all sorts of junk. One rabbi who wrote in 250 A.D., said this, all manner of service that a slave must render to his master, the pupil must render to his teacher, except that of taking off his shoe. It was the ultimate display of, of servanthood, of humility, of lowliness, of, of unimportance. Proper perspective on who God is will yield humility. Proper perspective on who God is will, will redefine the way that you think about your life. It's not that John wasn't great. Jesus says that of all men born, John is the greatest. It's not that John the Baptist wasn't significant. It's that in comparison to the one who's going to come, he's, he's not even fit to do the lowliest of tasks compared to the greatness of Christ. such humility, such reality, because that is the reality. Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater than John the Baptist. Jesus is greater than me. Jesus is greater than you. He preaches, make straight the way of the Lord because the king is coming. And in fact, the king has already come. The king has entered the world. The king is walking among them. Scene three is the proclamation. Got all the background. We understand why he's doing what he's doing. We've seen the conflict, the questioning of the leaders. Now comes the, the, the heart of this passage, the, the climax of this passage, 
the proclamation. Our gospel doesn't tell us this, but running in the background of this passage is the baptism of Jesus. Prior to this moment, Jesus has been baptized by John. So though John doesn't talk about it, the other gospels do. And they tell us that Jesus, when he was baptized, that God had sent his spirit in the form of a dove to rest on Jesus to signify that he is indeed the anointed one and to and a voice came from heaven and, and said loudly, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. This is all running in the background of this story. This is why John is, I believe, so confident to be able to address the Pharisees because he has seen with his own eyes the glory of the one whom he refers to. Unbelievable moment in the history of our world, the baptism of Jesus. So while the other Gospels record the baptism of Jesus, only one Gospel, our, our Gospel of John, records what happened when Jesus went back, when Jesus returns and goes back to the Jordan. John wants us to understand something very important about Christ's identity. In fact, this whole book, the whole Gospel of John, in some ways is, is a progressive revelation of the mystery of the identity of Christ. He plays all his cards up front with the prologue, and then you'll see as the book goes, he's progressively revealing himself to people in various ways that he is the one who is sent from God. And this passage helps us to understand the same thing. Read what the proclamation in verse 29. The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, did not know him to be the Messiah. He was his cousin. He knew Jesus. He didn't know that he was the one who was chosen by God. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose, I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. Now we understand why he comes out of the woods. It's for this purpose. It's so that the one who would come to save souls would be revealed. And then he bears witness. I saw the Spirit. He tells of what the other Gospels say. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove and remain on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, which is Jesus, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Verse 34, and I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. All of the Old Testament pointed forward to Christ. All of the New Testament letters reflect back upon Christ. But John the Baptist gets the unique privilege in time and space to declare to the world, behold, the Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sins of the world, is here. He's present. He's come. What an amazing picture he writes, he presents of Christ. He calls him the Lamb of God. Now, if you're not a Christian, that language may seem weird and probably is not even meaningful to you. If you are a Christian, you've probably heard that language over and over and over again, and maybe you're not even sure what it means. You just use it as, as a Christian phrase. Here's what it means when he says, that Jesus is the Lamb of God. He's saying Jesus is the sacrifice of God. The Old Testament is replete with examples of sacrifices of sheep and of lamb and of bulls and of goats. Jesus is like the lamb led to the slaughter. Jesus is the sacrifice come to die. So last week we saw that he was the eternal creator. This week he's come to die. What a contrast. The Word, the eternal Word, come to die as the Lamb of God. When John the Baptist cries out about this Lamb, he's got all the heritage of his Jewish faith behind him. He's speaking into the Jewish culture. There would be a very vivid and real image in his mind as he's speaking about this Lamb. He's got Isaiah 40 in his mind about himself. He's got Isaiah 53 in his mind about Jesus which writes, 
Isaiah writes, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. For he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter. And like a sheep, before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Yet, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came so that we could behold and believe in the sin bearer, the Lamb of God. He came so we could behold his glory and that we could believe that he is the Lamb of God, the one who takes away all of our sins. Every sin past, every sin present, every sin future laid upon him who was led to the slaughter like a lamb for our sake. He took our sin on the cross. He came and made a once-for-all sacrifice Once for all done, for every sin, for every person who puts their faith in him, not just for Israel, but for everyone. He died on that cross for you and for me. He came to make peace with God. He came to reconcile men to God. He came to bear upon himself the righteous wrath that you and I deserve for our sins so that we would not have to taste the death that we deserve, but that we could have the promise of a door opening into eternal life. He came as a lamb to take away our sins. That's why this gospel is so important to understand. How does this help us? How do we we take this call, this, this reality, this truth about who Jesus is, how does it make a difference in our lives today? All these years later, what function, what role does the Lamb of God who takes away sins play for us today? I've got four, four things, four points of application. And I pray that it, one of these, if not all of them, would find you in the right spot today. We're called to behold and believe. And as we behold, we're humbled. As we behold the Lamb of God, we're humbled. The Lamb of God was the God of lambs. He was the God of sheep. He was the God of us, his people. The sacrifice was the Savior. Let that take your breath away once again. The Word became flesh to dwell among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as from the Father who has now been led to the cross. When we behold Christ, we're beholding the eternal Word, We're beholding him, lowering himself, humbling himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a criminal's cross. Proper perspective on God creates humility within within us. That's one of the things we see in John the Baptist's life. It's hard to be puffed up and proud when you're comparing yourself to God and what Christ has done. So let the truth of the gospel, let the truth of what Jesus has done humble you and remind you, just like John the Baptist, It's not about you. It's not about your fame. It's not about you making a name for yourself. It's not about you keeping your reputation. It's about you revolving your life around the one who is worthy, the Son, Jesus the Lamb. As you behold, you're humbled. As you behold, you're cleansed. The picture of the story is one of baptism. It's one of cleansing, physical cleansing out in the water with hopes that one would come who would bring cleansing from the inside. And that's what Jesus does. He, he comes to us by faith and his word says that he renews us from the inside out. He transforms us. He gives us a new birth 
And then he begins to transform us into his own image. Religious metaphors in the Bible all point to this. We've been cleansed from our sins. We've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. It's religious language to say basically the same spiritual truth. The Lamb of God has taken the penalty for your sin and has washed you and has cleansed you from everything. All your sins. Listen, if we were to write out the list of our sins and, and, and roll them out on a scroll, it would extend far beyond the Rio Vista Recreation Center. Picture your sins being scrolled out for all to see. You're guilty. Not one of us in this room is innocent before God. It takes like a racer to all of it. And it's gone. Cleansed. So if you're feeling guilty, if the sins you've committed today, this week, are condemning you, it's because you are guilty. So acknowledge your guilt, but go to the one who can cleanse, and that's Jesus. As you behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, remember, he's taken away your sins, he's cleansed you. Third, behold and be changed. Oh, what a promise we have that he cleanses us, but aren't we grateful that he doesn't leave us in the same state that we came to him in? He cleanses us and he changes us. As we behold the Lamb, this truth makes all the difference in your life. It's not just past sins that get pardoned. You get to be transformed by the Lamb who takes away your sins. So if you have fear of the future, if you get up out of bed in the morning and you feel like you're already defeated, you can't even start your day, you don't know how things are going to work out, you've got fears, you've got things encroaching upon you, how does the the knowledge of the Lamb of God help you? Well, it reminds you that you are forgiven. You are now a child of God, which means your identity is his son or daughter. You step out of your bed in the morning completely righteous, counted righteous in Christ. You step out of your bed in the morning with a day of grace ahead of you. The knowledge that you will never be forsaken by God is the grace that you need to get up every day and walk and walk and walk faithfully. And to face the future, knowing that God loves you. That will never change. You get out of bed, and then you immediately sin. Okay, what do you do then? When you and your spouse start talking about what to have for breakfast, and you start arguing, and before you know it, you're not even arguing about the food. You're arguing about your argument, and you just want to say something mean and just win the argument. What do you do then? Well, you're reminded that the blood of the Lamb convicts you of sin. The cost of Jesus, the cost of God to send Jesus convicts us. It took a death. It took the death of the Savior. As we behold the Lamb, we see the bloody cross. It reminds us of not only God's great love, but his great sacrifice for us. And it melts our hearts. And we repent. You're doubting God's provision. Business is suffering. Work is, hours are being cut. Money is tough to come by. How does this help you then? You call to mind the Lamb of God who takes away sins, and it reminds you that your greatest need, your greatest need has been taken care of by God. He's done the hardest thing for you. How will he not provide all things? That's what Romans says. It says that if he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? You can trust God. You can trust him with your future. You can trust him to provide. He clothes the lilies of the field. He gives food to the birds of the air. He will take care of you. If you're not a Christian, you can summarize all three of these points into one, and that's this. Behold the Lamb of God and be saved. The humbling, the cleansing, the changing that comes from God comes from someone who has put their faith and hope and confidence and trust in what Jesus did, in the sin bearing. Behold the Lamb and be saved. The whole earth is Jesus. He owns the whole world. He claims your life. He's your authority. Your life was meant to revolve around him. 
If you're not living your life for him, you're, you're not just going your own way. You're rejecting the very reason for why you exist. Behold and be saved and you will be humbled, you will be cleansed, and you will be changed by God. Some people see it, some people don't. These leaders that came down, they come to question John the Baptist. They come with a, a, an authority over him. He preaches the scriptures back to them. They don't see it. They don't believe. What's your attitude towards Jesus? Do you see? Do you believe? He is the truth. The great English preacher Charles Spurgeon was testing out the acoustics of the new hall that he had built. Thinking he was alone, he went up to the top of the rafters and onto the balcony and he shouted at the top of his lungs, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The janitor who was fulfilling his duties heard this voice, was cut to the heart, convicted of the great many sins that he had and believed it to be God speaking to him directly and was converted. The same can happen for you to believe on Jesus. Believe that he's died for you. Believe that he lived for you. Believe that he rose for you. And commit yourself to following him as a new disciple, which we're going to see next week in the passage the call of discipleship, and he promises to give you the gift of eternal life. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away all our sins. Amen. Let's pray together. What a picture, God. What a picture that you gave us in this word. He could have just said, I'm John the Baptist. But he points to the one who's going to come. He could have said, it's Jesus. But he tells us of the lamb. The lamb who was going to be slain for sinners. The lamb who is right now in heaven receiving worship from thousands upon thousands and myriads upon myriads who are calling out through their songs, worthy is the lamb who was slain. For all eternity we'll be celebrating the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Help it to make a difference in our lives today, God, so that we might reflect your glory and that others might come to know the Lamb of God through our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.